What do you do <laughs> when your partner wants to have sex, but you don't, or vice versa? And then how do you make that decision? I'm coming up on 24 years of marriage to my husband, Patrick, who I call Patty. And for a majority of this time, these questions were coming up for us daily. It seemed like he always wanted to have sex, and it seemed like I never did. And this caused tension and resentment between us. And if this hasn't happened to you, I'm glad. And then I have to tell you, statistically speaking, this hasn't happened to you yet. Amy Muse, who is the director of the Sexual Health and Relationships Lab at York University, conducted a series of studies. And she found that 80% of people had experienced this kind of issue in the past month. And 95% of people, which is almost all, had experienced it in the past year. This is one of the most common challenges faced by couples. And although it's extremely common, it can also be serious, leading to breakups and divorce. So these questions and how you handle them becomes important. How do you make this decision? What criteria do you use to decide whether to do it or not? Most of us, we're going by how we feel and or what our genitals are doing or maybe what they're not doing. But how many of us truly understand how our minds and bodies work together to create sexual desire? I thought I knew until I found out I didn't really understand, which has led to the last few years where I've read thousands of pages of books and articles and scientific research studies discovering all the things I thought I knew about sex, but turns out I didn't really understand. I thought a libido worked like this. You suddenly feel like you want to have sex, and it could be as simple as seeing someone that you find attractive. This is what scientists refer to as spontaneous desire. And according to Emily Nagoski, who is a world-renowned sex educator, she estimates that this is true for approximately 75% of men. <laughs> this, this has never happened to me. <laughs> Which made sense when I learned that she estimates only approximately 15% of women experience spontaneous desire. Many more of us experience what scientists refer to as responsive desire. <laughs> Men can also have responsive desire, but the way this works is that the person has to be turned on, legitimately sexually aroused before they're ever gonna feel like they wanna have sex. When I learned this, this was like an epiphany for me. First, because it meant I wasn't broken, but then also because it made sense, even though I never really felt like having sex, I liked it when I did. And I wish sexual arousal was as easy as this, just push the on button, but for many of us, it's much more complicated than that. And I think most of us know that we need to learn what the turn-ons are and do more of that, what we might not recognize is that we also have to learn what the turnoffs are and stop doing that. And only when both of these things are happening can some of us ever reach true sexual arousal, which then begs the question, how do you know if your partner is sexually aroused or not? There have been several times in my marriage when my husband Patty and I were getting frisky, and I'm super into it super horny, and yet, it's like the Sahara down there. <laughs> Believe it or not, me and my dry vagina, and this guy in his nocturnal penile tumescence, also known as slumber lumber or morning wood, <laughs> we're experiencing the same physiological phenomenon that scientists refer to as arousal non-concordance. And all this means is that there's a disconnect between how we feel and what our genitals are doing. And this isn't happening just occasionally. According to studies that are conducted in labs, this is happening in men approximately 50% of the time during these experiments. And women, 90% of the time. 
And what this tells us, what the science tells us, is that our genitals are not accurate indicators of sexual desire or arousal. And the only way to know if your partner is turned on or not is to ask them. So now that I've given you the four minute high level crash course on sexual desire and arousal, <laughs> let's go back to our decision to do it or not and our criteria. So if we go by how we feel and we have responsive desire, we may never feel like it because something sexual already has to be going on. We have to say yes to something before we're ever going to feel like it. And our genitals, we just learned that at least half the time they are doing their own thing. So between our fickle genitals and our finicky libidos, it should be clear we don't actually have conscious control over this part of our sexuality. But we could take control. We could take control by using different criteria, better criteria to make this decision based on science. In all the other areas of our lives, we allow science to help us make better decisions. To take just a couple easy examples, exercise and nutrition. If I only ever did what I felt like doing, I would never work out. And I'd be living primarily on a diet made up of popcorn, cookies, and beer. But I don't do that. We don't do that. We make decisions for the betterment of our health and well-being based on science. Why not also do that with sex? Then I started to think, well, maybe it's because we don't really understand what all the benefits of sex are. So I'm going to show you and give you just a couple seconds to take it in. These benefits, they're supported by over 65 scientific research studies. And each one of them have certain aspects of sex that make them true. Many can be accomplished through orgasm alone, but not all. So as a general rule, if you're in a committed relationship and you've made a habit of having mutually satisfying sex at least once a week, you'll enjoy these benefits. And some of these might look familiar. Maybe they're something you've heard before or they're your experience, stuff like, Sex is exercise, and you bet I am counting that as a workout. <laughs> but some of these are surprising. Patty and I were at the doctor, and we were discussing his high risk for prostate cancer. And the doctor turned to us, and it's because of his family history, and the doctor turned to us and he said, you know, the best thing you can do is just have lots of sex. And Patty turned to me and he said, did you hear that, Sam? The doctor just <laughs> prescribed lots of sex. And then he even went so far as to actually get him to write the prescription so that I could take that home and keep it in the bedside table. I needed proof. So what did I do? I went and did the research. And sure enough, there are several studies that show a high frequency of ejaculation lowers the risk of prostate cancer. And it can do this by as much as 50%. And that's coming out of Harvard, two studies coming out of Harvard. Another shocker up here reduces the pain of headaches. In the study that I read, it showed that migraine sufferers who could bring themselves to sexual activity to the point of orgasm, which by the way is a very small percentage of people, but of those people, the majority of them experienced partial to full relief of these extremely intense headaches. There goes that excuse. <laughs> that wasn't my go-to excuse, though. My go-to, especially at night, was I am too damn tired to have sex. But if someone had said to me, Sam, you know, if you have an orgasm before you go to bed, you're going to fall asleep faster, stay asleep longer, and you're going to enjoy more REM sleep, which is the restful kind of sleep, I might have sacrificed those two to 20 minutes of sleep. <laughs> But my favorite ones up here, I have two. It makes you happier than money. And there are several studies that show this, and a few scientists who have even been able, been able to quantify it, saying a satisfying sex life actually makes you happier than $50,000 extra annual income. <laughs> and longevity. People who engage in satisfying active sex lives live 
longer. Sex is a linchpin of health. It's the fountain of youth, and it's a key to a happy and long-lasting relationship. Oh, and life. Not even to mention that other thing, that it's one of the most pleasurable experiences available to the human being. And if sex isn't pleasurable for you, that's a whole other talk. <laughs> but what I will say is it can be, and don't give up. As I mentioned earlier, this decision to do it or not was an issue for Patty and I. And it was like one of these problems we couldn't figure out how to solve. And one day he came to me with a proposal, an experiment he wanted us to try. And he said, honey, what if for the next 30 days, every time I want to have sex, you just say yes? <laughs> and I suddenly pictured this guy. <laughs> This is my husband, Patty. <laughs> and I suddenly pictured him, just like this, chasing me around the house with an erection for a month. <laughs> and I said, no. <laughs> no, I'm not doing that. And he said, why? And I said, because I don't want to have sex when I don't want to have sex. And then I realized I was always having sex when I didn't want to have sex. I didn't know what it was called back then, but I have responsive desire. So I actually agreed to this experiment. And as soon as I said yes, I thought, I wonder if Costco sells lube. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. The first few days were a sex-o-rama. But after that, it tapered off to like once, twice a week. And as it turned out, Patty wasn't asking all the time because he wanted to have sex all the time. He was asking all the time just to get me to say yes occasionally. And all of the tension and resentment that's built up around the negotiation completely dissolved. Not only that, but when you have sex with your partner, your bodies are flooded with feel-good hormones that promote bonding and intimacy. And we could feel that. Not just the physical intimacy, but the emotional intimacy was blossoming too. In fact, this experiment went so well that we never stopped. <laughs> but now the deal is, anytime either one of us wants to have sex, we just say yes. And believe it or not, I actually instigate more than he does now. And it's not because I feel sexual desire, because I still don't until we get started. But I do that because when we aren't having sex often enough, I really miss that connection with him. I don't want to brag, <laughs> but <laughs> Patty and I are one of the happiest couples we know. And I needed to show you a different picture of him. <laughs> There are a lot of great things about our relationship, but sex and the immediate pleasure and intimacy that it brings, it seems like it sort of smooths out all the rough edges, and it really seems like a wonder drug for our relationship. Next time you're faced with this decision to do it or not, these questions, I hope that you'll consider saying yes, as loving acceptance of your partner, as a beautiful gift to your relationship, but also for your own health, longevity, and happiness. Thank you.